All righty. Welcome, 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 everyone, to this new episode of Embodied Memories of the Bay, Narratives of African Diasporic Religious Communities. We are privileged, privileged, and honored to have with us today Ia Halifo Oshumare who is going to speak with us about her experiences, her myriad experiences um, as an academic, as a scholar, as a priestess. So welcome, 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 Iya Halifu. Thank you so much, Iya Kadidra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so or, or I should say Mambo Kadidra. Mambo Khadija, thank yeah. you. Um, thank you, Ia. I'm so excited, you know, to to talk with you. And I'm, you know, I can't wait to jump right in. So we were talking before we started recording about your names. And of course, you have many names. And so um, we agreed that, you know, I, I would refer to you, I'd call you Ia Halifo Oshumare. Um, and that's what you prefer to be called during this interview. And of course, if there are other names that come up, maybe they'll come out in the course of our conversation, but but we'll we'll go with that. And well, so I can tell you that other names will definitely come out. They'll come up. Awesome. Because they're so beautiful. So I'm so glad <laughs> that they come up. They're really beautiful. I love deciphering the names, right? From the little bit that I understand about, um, you know, African linguistics. I love deciphering the names. So that's cute. So Ia Halifu Oshumare, can you please share with us what pronouns you use? Uh, she, her, hers. Okay, thank you. And um, which city do you currently live in? We're gonna we're gonna start off with kind of like the basics, you know, where you currently live, um, and then we'll jump into uh, with our life history interview chronologically. Like we'll talk about your, you know, your past upbringing, and and we'll kind of end with bringing us forward to the present. Okay. So to start us off, since this is you know focused on the Bay Area, which city do you currently live in? Well, I actually live in Sacramento, California, okay. um, and but I I lived and worked in the uh, the San Francisco Oakland Bay Area for for many years, uh, but I moved to Sacramento in 2005 for my position at uh, the University of California at Davis. Okay, well, awesome, thank you, and um. So when you, you said that you lived in the, in the Bay Area, were you, did you grow up in the Bay Area? Yes, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, my family was one of those um, Black families who moved from the South, Texas, to be mm. exact, uh, to uh, the North, San Francisco, California, for better opportunities for Negroes, right? That was that was the, mm -hmm. the usual phrase that was used. And so um, I, I grew up in, um, in San Francisco from age nine um, and uh, went to you know elementary, middle school, high school, San Francisco State University before I left and started traveling and spreading out and, and living other places. So the Bay Area, San Francisco and Oakland because when I returned to the Bay Area, I, I moved to Oakland instead of San Francisco. And that's mm. where I did a lot of my early artistic work from the late seventies into the eighties. So I, I really consider myself a, a Bay Area person uh, now living in Sacramento. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for giving us that overview. Yeah, right. So you certainly are a Bay Area aficionado. <laughs> So this, this is this is going to be going to be really great um, to hear. Uh, and um, may I ask what year you were born and where were you born? Okay, uh, I was born in 1946, so I'm a baby boomer, um, mm -hmm. and I am 76 years old this uh, at this point. And I I was born in Galveston, Texas, mm -hmm. which people might know is the home of Juneteenth. Yes. That's where, where, where uh, the uh, only holiday that we have commemorating the end of slavery mm -hmm. started in Galveston. And um, so I, I like to think of myself as coming from a kind of empowered community 
because they mm -hmm. were the, one of the first to really celebrate Juneteenth. Um, and I was, uh, my early education started during uh, segregation in mm -hmm. an all black educational system that was very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we moved to San Francisco, I found that I was way ahead of my, um, my, my young peers in the fourth grade. <laughs> Um, yeah, they uh, they were not where where I was, and it showed me that um, we had an excellent educational system uh, with all black teachers that um, could rival you know anything in San Francisco at that time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Oh, I'd love to just talk to you just about that. We we gonna have to you know talk again offline just 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 about that part. I'm so you know, with, with the history of education and, and um, you know, Black education and these, you know, we're calling these fugitive spaces, right? And the legacy of Black education, the excellence, the legacy of Black excellence. Yes, that, for um, sure. that story that's been forgotten, you know, um, but, but has produced, right? Um, lots and lots of greats and, and excellent students. So, so Galveston, Texas, and then, you know, I guess when you were nine years old or around that time, and that's when you then, you know, you and your family migrated to, to San Francisco yes, and, and you grew up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk a little bit about, right, like your early upbringing. Um, what faith community did you grow up in, if, if any? Well, in, in Galveston, uh, I went to Baptist church, uh, it was my grandmother's church. Um, and you know, was really enamored with the music, gospel choirs, and you know, and, and that that whole uh, cultural milieu. But when we moved to San Francisco, uh, my mother wasn't um, really uh, that attached to the the Baptist faith, and she basically said, "I don't care what church you go to, but we got to find a church for you to go to." And one of uh, one of my uh, first friends in San Francisco was Catholic and went to Catholic school. And there was a Catholic church um, that was mm, just maybe three or four blocks from our from our home in the Lower Fillmore District of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So um, we ended. I ended up joining Sacred Heart Catholic Church and grew up um, once we moved to San Francisco as a Catholic. Okay. Yeah. So I um to clarify, were your parents also a member of the church or did they allow you to No, to they weren't. You know, okay. occasionally uh, my mother went uh sometimes. She insisted that we go, but she went sometimes and my my stepfather who at that point was raising us, he never went. <laughs> no. mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so we so we it wasn't a family that um was really strictly religious, but mm -hmm. they knew the importance of religion in terms of our upbringing and insisted that we do uh, find some faith and go to church. Okay. And so what, what was that experience like? Um, you know, that, that transition, if you, you know, what was that like as a little girl, you were, you know, um, grew up in the Baptist church, you know, predominantly black or all black church, Baptist church in the South. And then this Catholic church, um, what was, what were the demographics like in this class, um, Catholic church? Um, it was, um, mixed. It was, uh, white, uh, black, mm -hmm. Asian, Latino, mm -hmm. um, because that, that's the demographics of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely, you know, was not, you know, the all black environment that I was used to mm -hmm. before moving to San Francisco. But I found that um, just as a, 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 a person, even as a, a, as a young girl, I, I'm very adaptable. And so is as long as I feel welcome, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can fit in. And um, so I, I didn't feel it at all alienated, you know, within the, the Catholic church. And I really bought into it um, hook, line and sinker. We went, uh, I, I, uh, I had my first Holy Communion and, and 
confirmation. So I went all the way and, and went to catechism class on the weekends. So I got deeply into the Catholic faith. Oh wow. Oh, awesome. And and um so let let's talk about like how long did you stay, you know, as a practicing Catholic? Um if you are you still practicing? Oh no. No. Okay. <laughs> no. I have definitely not a practicing Catholic at this point. I okay. left the church at about I would say about age 18, right after high school. Okay. Because I started becoming more conscious of um you know, the, my social political environment. And I remember one incident that happened in another church, not the one that I kind of grew up in where we first lived in San Francisco, but another one that I went to, um, there was an incident with a, a white woman as we were leaving church after going through the mass, receiving the, uh, Holy communion and, and the whole, um, process that goes on in the, the ceremony of the Catholic Church. Um, I remember leaving, I was at, it was, we were walking out the door. I somehow I bumped up against her or brushed her and she looked at me like as if I had just hauled off and hit her or mm. it was just, you know, like she was offended that I even touched her. And, mm. and I, I could immediately see that it smacked of racism. And that made me, just that one incident made me begin to question continuing, okay. you know, in, in, in the church. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and so I started exploring just in general spirituality from that point. And uh, as I said, I'm a baby boomer. So when I was, when, uh, I was around 18, 19, it was uh, the beginning of the hippie movement. And okay. that, was, that was a big social revolution that mm -hmm. was going on, particularly in the Bay Area, you know, that produced people like musicians like Sly and the Family Stone and, yeah. and Jimi Hendrix and, um, you know, all, all the, uh, the, uh, the, the pop and rock artists that came out of that, that hippie movement. So I started exploring other religions. I started reading about Eastern religion. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I started looking at the I Ching and I started doing, learning how to divine with the I Ching. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So I, I, uh, and, and at that time I was going to San Francisco state and that was a bedrock of, of, uh, social, uh, activism on all levels, you know, yeah. in terms of, um, uh, political, um, religious, social cultural, everything was, was uh, really in flux at that time. So I, uh, I feel that I really had um, um, an opportunity to explore, you know, uh, the, the, a sense of what spirituality itself was all about. That's mm -hmm. supposed to be underpinning all religions. And that, and that kind of just led me away from the Catholic church and plus I started, you know, um, smoking marijuana and getting high and, okay, you know, so, so that, that, that whole scene just kind of took, took me over. And I started seeing the different levels of reality in a certain kind of way that, um, would not allow me to go back to the, the, the strictures of, uh, the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. This is so fascinating. And you, I mean, you, I just feel like, like you were just born at the perfect time. You know, I, like, I, I, I say just, that right now because I look at current day youth and what they're going through <laughs> and how much conflict they have about, about, um, with social media and, and, um, their, their sense of lack of self-confidence and needing so much validation from other people. And I'm going, mm -hmm. You know what is what is going on? I you know I would not want to be a, a a youth trying to explore who I was and trying to come of age in this time. It's very very complex, mm -hmm. and a lot of things are stacked against our young people today. 
in a way that did not exist when, when I was in my um, late teens, early 20s. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, I, I have an idea, but just can, can you, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, I'm, I, I mean, I'm thinking about it in terms of, wow, just like the, you know, you, you experience the, the segregated schools that again, the beauty of the segregated schools, right, was the, was the, the focus on community and the focus on, you know, on, so on uplifting your blackness and, and uplifting your race. Right, um, and that's something that kind of with with desegregation, many of many of us lost that right yeah. with desegregation because the black teachers lost their jobs. <laughs> you know, primarily, right? They they fired like our black teachers and administrators. So like you you were able to kind of have this foundation, right? Um, and then you know, then you were also experiencing right this you know, this time in the 60s and the 70s, the Black Power Movement, San Francisco State, all these exciting things going on. Um, and, and you know, now we're at a time, like, what do you say, I would say, you know, is maybe like like the biggest difference that you see, you know, um, with youth yes. today? Like, what is it that you feel like maybe that really girded you and that strengthened you and that was really important to your identity development that you don't see today or that you don't see as much of today? I think the one major difference is that we were supported in being critical thinkers. Mm. That, that, that the, the, the kind of um, environment of challenging our, the system in a major way for the first time. Coming out of the 50s, you know, that was, um, you know, when, when you look at, um, how sociology uh, and history teaches you about the decades as, as they developed in the 20th century um, was the kind of like suburban uh, uh, Aussie and Harriet kind of dream mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of what kind of life you should have. We challenged all of that in the, in the, the late, by the late sixties, you know, all of that was being debunked and, un and, and unpacked in a way that um, it's just not happening today. Um, mm -hmm. the, we were, it, it was cool to be a critical thinker. It was, it was, uh, it was cool to be a nonconformist, to okay. not follow the trends, you know, of your, of your parents' middle-class aspirations. It was, um, uh, it was important to be a rebel when I was growing up mm. and now it seems to me that um, uh, today, the, the whole issue of just being recognized and wanting fame is, 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 the, is, is the kind of impetus for a lot of young people. That's why they're so glued to social media and wanting likes and, and, and friends and followers and um, that was not what we were about. We were about, you know, challenging the the system, challenging everything that was told about the way in which we were supposed to live and and aspire to. And so, um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say that the 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 atmosphere of of being pushed to be a critical thinker was the, one of the key. Um, elements of the late 60s mm -hmm. and moving into the, the 70s. Now, the other part of it um, was that that um, the deconstruction of the whole political system and um, our sense of um, who we were as Black people was also evolving along with that critical thinking. And so to be at San Francisco State when the Third World Liberation Movement started, wow. and and um, the Black Student Union was being formed. When I, when I entered, right after graduating from high school and I entered uh, San Francisco State, I joined what was called the Negro Student Association. Within one year, it had changed to the Black Student Union. And, wow. it, and, and, and that, that, that name, that moniker, you know, re really represented the kind of revolutionary um, times that we were in. We were throwing off the, the Negro and we were really em, embla embracing um, our Blackness. 
and mm -hmm. and wanting to learn more about Africa and 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 what was still African about us. And so uh, the the push for black studies started at the same institution where I'm going to uh, to undergraduate school. And I was around that. And, and we eventually got into a point where there were no classes because we were out, you know, uh, marching around the mm. campus, you know, and and stopping everything that um, was supposed to be the norm at that point in order to get what we wanted. And eventually, you know, um, the School of Ethnic Studies uh, was the first right. uh, in, in the nation at uh, San Francisco State. So um, yeah, it, it was a, a, a really um, important time to come of age. And, I, and I've actually written about it in my memoir called Dancing in Blackness. Oh, okay. I'll have to send you a copy of that because you uh you should you should check it out. I, I have oh, I begun to tell you. my I could I have begun to tell my story. And so um the chapter one of my memoir uh is um coming of age through black dance in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area. That's the title of the of chapter one. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh, I would love that. I would love that. Thank you. Yes. I have dancing and blackness. Um, oh my goodness, you've just you're, you're just given us such a rich history, a rich, you know. I know everybody here who's listening who knows anything at all, anything about education, ethnic studies, Africana studies, black studies. I know like their ears are tingling, you know, because you were there. These things that we just read about and that we see in documentaries, you know, we we have the privilege and honor of hearing directly from someone who was there, who lived it. So yeah. this, it's just, um, yeah, it's it, it's incomparable. Thank thank you so much for sharing that that history with us. And um, you know, you 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 mentioned this was a time where you were exploring. This was a time in the sixties where you started exploring different uh, spiritual traditions, started Eastern traditions, I Ching. You know, where people were looking like you, younger people were looking for their connections with Africa. And so now I let thinking about the presence, what are the various communities or groups that you are a part of? So that can include spiritual groups, religious communities, but also any other kinds of communities and groups or organizations that you are part of that you think are really important. Like what, what, what groups are you a members of now? Well, you know, um, as, uh, as a um, artist and an academic, I, I'm, um, uh, I keep my memberships in several national organizations. The um, International Association of Blacks and Dance is one of my main one that I continually to support. Okay. That's been around for, for about 34 years now. And, and I've been involved with it since, since it, its inception. Um, the... Um, Association for the Study of Worldwide uh, African Diaspora, ASWAD is another organization that I maintain a membership in and I have presented at their conferences um, and, uh, and, uh, and been a part of that organization. Um, the Dance Studies Association is another um, national organization because you know I was a dancer choreographer for many decades. Uh, and that's why I always, the lens through which I kind of see my life and see my progressions is through dance. So mm -hmm. Dancing in Blackness, the current book that is, will be coming out at the end of, of uh, 2023, uh, which is a sequel um, to okay. Dancing in Black. It's called, it's called Dancing the Afro Future. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at my life through the lens of dance, whether it's physically dancing on stage or in the studio or the the metaphoric dance of life. And and I and I even talk about in, in my memoir how writing becomes a kind of process of dancing for me on the page. So mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> You know, those three organizations I just gave you, uh, two of them are dance organizations. The other is um, about the uh, the African diaspora, the study of the African diaspora. 
Mm -hmm. um, then um, currently <clears throat> here in Sacramento, I'm on the board of directors of, a, of the premier black theater company here in Sacramento called Celebration Arts. And that's very important for me because throughout my career, I've always been uh, <clears throat> community oriented. And yes, I've, I, I have written and published and all of that, but I'm, I always want to make, try to make a difference in my own immediate community. And yeah, the, the being on that board of directors of the Black Theater Company allows me to be in contact with um, current day artists mm. uh, who are practicing, uh, Black artists who are practicing in Sacramento and helping to continue to um, spread the, the gospel of Black arts and uh, keeping that going in, in our communities. So um, yes, that was definitely uh, something that I wanted to continue. And every place I have lived, I have usually worked with some kind of community organization. Also in just right in my neighborhood association, uh, there is, uh, we, have a, we have a very strong neighborhood association okay. in the district where I live. And uh, they have a clubhouse where I go and work out at their gym. And I, um, I joined um, the Juneteenth and Black History Committee that they had oh. there. And, uh, and, every, and, and every February we put on an event for just our, our neighborhood and the membership of that organization. So it's important for me to think globally and write about how I see you know, um, myself as a, a black scholar and artist in the world as it continues to shift and change, but also mm -hmm. to be local and to focus mm -hmm. on um, my immediate community and try to make a difference. Now, of course, I, um, I'm a, a, a practicing Yoruba priestess and I um, am a member of a particular ELA that is in Oakland, Oakland, California. Okay. Yeah, it's called Ihin Nuri Temple and our, uh, uh, our, our main priest is um, Iya Ohenemeni, or some people know her because she, she's also an artist, Nedra Williams. Mm -hmm. So she she is uh, she's my spiritual mother at this point. She's not the the that's not the house that I first got initiated in, but she is um, the one that I am with at this point. Uh, Ihenuri oh. Temple, and that is very important to me. Um, in terms of, uh, of being connected to a spiritual community in the tradition in which um, I now practice. Mm -hmm. And so and for, for our listeners, for those who are listening, right, you can go because we've, we've, we've interviewed Ia Ohin. We've interviewed, oh. well, well, actually, Ohin Imene. We've, we've, we've interviewed Ohin on, oh, our, uh, on our podcast. So you can um, also make sure that you look at her, take a look at her life history interview, and then you're going to see the, um, and so you, you, so you refer to her as your, your spiritual mother in the tradition or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yes. So Ia Halifu's spiritual mother. Oh, so we have, we have mother and daughter <laughs> on the, <laughs> Um, on the podcast, beautiful, beautiful. That was such an extraordinary interview. Oh my God. Yes, yeah, she, she's uh, she's a a powerful mm. uh, spiritual leader, and uh, I'm very um, honored to be in her house. Wow, this is right, and we so and we you know we we also did our our um our interview, uh, which was more like a. I mean, it was an interview and it, it was a, you know, it was a visit to her home for her artistic expression. So that's something that that's going to come out sometime soon, um, because one of one of her godchildren actually did the recording. So when he when he puts it together, that that's going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm beautiful sure work. We, we had a good time. So we're we're in for a treat for another treat with that. And um, oh, awesome, awesome. 
So, you know, tell me about your weekend. You talked about it, you know, a little bit, but can you talk to me about your involvement in your current faith community? I know you mentioned that you're a member of this ELE in Oakland um, with, with Ohen Imene, um, led by Ohen Imene. And then you're, you know, you're a part of the broader community of, of Yoruba traditional faith practitioners. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit more about like, like how did you become introduced to this tradition in general, you know, and what attracted you to it? Well, um, I, again, I think I have to, to go back to my, my um, interest in dance. Okay. Because I started um, one of the major dance centers for African diasporic dance in in um, Oakland. Uh, it was initially called Everybody's Creative Arts Center, and mm -hmm. that morphed into um, what was called City Center Dance Theater. Mm -hmm. It was one of the anchor tenants in the old Alice Art Center on on Alice and 14th Street in Oakland. And today that center is called the Malonga Cascade Lord Center for the Arts. It is the place for African mm -hmm. dance, music, and African diasporic forms, ha Haitian, Cuban, uh, Brazilian, hip hop, all of the, uh, the di mm -hmm. diasporic dance forms. I'm mentioning that because um, it was through that center that I started hiring when I was the, the artistic director, um, you know, people from the traditions who, who would teach the dance forms of the tradition. You know, there were people who were teaching Cuban dance and then they would teach some of the uh, Orisha dances as a part of the class. Yeah. I would teach, uh, they would be, uh, Blanche Brown would be teaching mm -hmm. Haitian, you know, dance and she would be teaching some of, of the, um, the voodoo dances. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, through just being in proximity to that kind of energy, the drumming, you know, because the drumming and the dance is, and the, and the singing is one of the, the central components of our, of our faith, right? Um, mm -hmm. So just being around that energy, I wanted to then find out what was behind all of this. And I started going to Bembe's ceremonies, and I uh, uh, and this was I'm talking about the mid '80s, mm. the mid 1980s, right now. And I um, I started um, with uh, another religious house, Ile Arumila Oshun, that okay. that that is uh, headed by um, Yeye Luisa Tish. Mm -hmm. um, Bia uh, Oshumiwa Fajimbola. Um, she is the founder of that particular ELA. And so they were my first ELA and she was my, um, my first teacher within the tradition. Um, mm -hmm. So I just started going to, um, to Bimbe's and she was also into dance and was teaching dance at, at our center. So you see, there was a connection between the right. arts Right. And the actual practice of the religion. And so it was through the dance that I started becoming interested in the foundation behind these dances mm -hmm. and these rhythms and these these um, songs that were being sung in, in the dance classes. And that got me interested in um, wanting to know more. Um, I started finding out the books that I should read. I started reading various um, books on your, the Yoruba religion. And um, as they say, one thing led to another. <laughs> All right. uh, and uh, I, um, I went through the stages of, of uh, becoming uh, a part of the religion. First joining, formally joining uh, um, Ile Orumila Oshun. Okay. Uh, receiving my alekes, the sacred bees of the Orishas, um, receiving uh, some of the initial uh, Orisha themselves, uh, the warriors. And um, then I moved to 
Hawaii. And now we're talking around the beginning of 1994, but I had that kind of early foundation okay. that I took with me to Hawaii. Um, I got my doctorate at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Manoa, okay. Okay. Yes. And so, uh, but it was so important that I had that foundation in the, the Yoruba religion that I took with me and mm -hmm. that I continued practicing with because it, it really gave me a, a solid foundation. As you well know, you know, it's, it's, it becomes your, your, the stability on which you then can grow, right. learn more, and, and add on to your life, but you have that foundation. And so the um, just becoming a part of the religion gave me a kind of um, solid foundation that allowed me to not be so susceptible to the changing winds of time. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would put it like that. Um, I didn't become uh, a priest until 2003 because mm -hmm. I am the kind of person that is, I'm not a joiner. <laughs> Let's put it that okay. way. You know, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very independent. And in fact, Halifu in Swahili means the independent rebellious child in the family. Oh, that's okay. what the meaning of Halifu is. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 enjo I enjoyed the ceremonies. I enjoyed the, 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 the kind of solid foundation that I felt from receiving the initial um, ceremonies. Um, but I was still not convinced that I was going to give my whole life up to this. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until 2003 that I finally said, okay, you got to put up or shut up. And, mm -hmm. and um, I said, okay, you've gone as far as you can go. You have read all the major books. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you have um, you have been to the ceremony. You have, you know, gotten possessed a few times, <laughs> and there's nothing else to do except just give give it up and say, "You got me. I'm ready." Okay. And so, in 2003, um, I was initiated for Oya mm -hmm. uh, in. Uh, in the house of Ile Arumila Oshun. And it was a, it was a, just a, a transition that I'll never regret. Mm. Let's put it that way. I will never regret it. It has been, I don't, when I, I thought the foundation of when I first started getting um, the beginning steps of joining was the foundation, getting initiated and crowned as mm. Omo Oya mm. has totally transformed my life. And mm. I can't imagine not, not, having, not having done it. Wow. Oh, my fairy phone. <laughs> Mama Oya. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And 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 um, you know, the there's always divination when you when you uh, uh when you first start the process and one of the major odus that came up for me then this is what they told me my elders told me that it kept coming up the long awaited one has finally arrived wow mm. I, said, mm -hmm. I was going off the circuitous route Thing, mm, you know, I don't know if I can give up my full power. Okay. And, and and finally, you know, I humbled myself because that's what it takes. You gotta you you gotta go on faith and humility. Yeah. And Surrender. When I did that, everything opened up. Oh wow, that's so beautiful. It there's so much that's resonating for me with your story. And I just, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it's, you know, it's so affirming. You know, so many of us have a, 
you know, like a, 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 a similarities. And I remember the first, um, the first fet that I went to, the first voodoo fet that I went to, and I was not initiated or anything. You know, I went to it and it was at Mommy Lola's house. God bless the oh, dead. Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. she's actually my my spiritual grandmother, my, 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 Mommy Lola. Wow. Um, yes. I, I have met her. I know her. I, I You know, well, I don't know her, but I, I have met her. And um, one of my closest friends was um, uh, taken to Haiti by her and 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 was initiated into the Vodun. Okay. So I Mambo I, Sushil. I don't know if you know her. She lives here in Sacramento. I I do not know. I do not know. Yeah, I, I got. I have to hook you two together. Please do. Please yeah. do. Yeah, you know. she was a she. Yeah, she was an, uh, initiated into the Vodun in oh. um, uh, in Haiti uh, about twenty oh seven, twenty oh eight, somewhere around there. Okay. And, uh, and and it was Mama Lola that set the whole thing up because she was very close uh, to to Mama Lola. Okay. Yes, I would love that. Um, you know, there's so many connections. I you know, my, Mambo Portia, my spiritual sister. I love Mambo Portia. You know who? Um, you know, I just I just met her online, and she just you know we just gravitated towards each other. But there's so many. Right, that particular house, Mommy Lola, I understand, made a lot of trips out here, you know, to yes, the Bay Area. Did. And had yeah, that's where I connections. met her when she came, she came to the Bay Area and mm -hmm. she was uh, you know, and she was um uh uh featured and various botanicas and and um uh uh homes, houses, and you know, and and it, it was it was just wonderful being in her presence, you mm. know, because she is a powerful woman. Yes. Yes. Mom, mom, mommy, we, we miss her. We, yes. we, 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 we miss her. We, you know, definitely very um, important elder in voodoo and, and, and in these traditions. And it's so beautiful to see how we're all connected. Yes. <laughs> we're and, all and, connected. And, and, and talk about uh, Mambo Portia and the relationship between the dance and the religion. Mm -hmm. you know, she's the embodiment of that. Oh, yes. Wow. Wow, I, I can't wait for I'm keep trying to get her to come, but I think I know what she's I think I know what's happening. I think that the space, the elders have to set the pace for us. I think that's what happens. I we, you know, we're she and I, you know, we're we're gonna get together. We're gonna we're, we're gonna talk on this, but but we really, really, you know, we 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 wanted to talk to the elders to to set the foundation because these are all names, you know, names that you're mentioning in your name. These are this this is legendary. These you're all a legend. And so these are the people who she talks about and she says, This happened and this happened. So it's just it's such a pleasure to have you on here. But um, you know, I I'll just say I'll just finish that little story that the first time, first fight I went to, um uh at Papa Ogu actually you know, and I didn't speak any Creole. I didn't understand whatever. But, you know, there was, you know, Mommy Lola, it was in her head, Papa Opu in her head. And she was like screaming. And I was like, why are they mad at me? Like, who? Like, then I realized, okay, this is a spirit. But why is he mad at me? <laughs> and then um, my spiritual mother, um, Florence Joseph, um, she, 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 she said, no, he say, he's asking, where have you been? Where have you been? I was still a college student at Stanford well, I was out here I was still a student but it, I was like he knows me. yeah, yeah he knows you all right he knows you you it, know it was yeah, so look, awesome <laughs> you know when, when you when you think about the the whole spirit world you know and how it transcends time you know like yeah. we think in terms of linear time and 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 that realm is, you know, time does not exist right. in, in the way we think about it. And so, um, you know, the, the fact that he's going, you know, he's been waiting for you, you know, it's like they, you know, we have to, we have to get to the point where we're re ready to embrace them, but they are already there, like just waiting, just waiting for, for us to finally get it, get it into our spirits, what we're supposed to do. Right. Wow. And I told you that's why when when uh 
when, when, when they did the divination, when I first started my initiation process, you know, it's like the long awaited one has finally arrived, you know, and I, so you could see them going, all right, is she going to finally get, is she gonna finally come? She's been dragging her feet. Is she, is she, is she ready now? Exactly. You know, so yeah, that's, that's what it is. But you, you, you know, that, you know, you are with the right family when, when you hear that, you know, it's like, we've been waiting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then that means, you know, we, we are ready to embrace you. Come my daughter. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. This is it. Thank you. This is, this is yeah connections here. This is family, <laughs> family connections that that we're making through through yeah. through our various um, spiritual lineages. God is good, and um, and speaking about family, right, and 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 lineage. I wonder, you know, I want to know, um, do you have any uh, spiritual children or or um, or or children whom you raised in your home, and if so, like what's their involvement in the tradition? Hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> I never, I did, I didn't have any biological children. However, I, um, I had two young women. I have two young women who, mm -hmm. um, I kind of adopted and they, okay. and they adopted me just a second. And, um, one happened in about about 2000, 2001, when I was living in Ohio at my uh, and working at Bowling Green State University, my oh. first institution before I came uh, back to Northern California and, um, and, and to UC Davis. And she was uh, a, a young woman who was into music and, and, uh, uh, she was getting her master's in music education and she started coming to my dance classes and she was someone who was very, she's very religious, very spiritual. She was in the, um, I, for lack of a better term, the uh, Holy Roller tradition. Okay. Okay. She was into that when I first met her. But okay. she was going in, in her music. Like Pentecostal, because I know, yeah, but just for the sake of Pentecostal, a holiness church. Right. Kojic, yes, okay. Exactly, that's, that's it. it. Okay. That, it's the Pentecostal holiness church. Okay. Um, uh, so on top of that, she was also going to West Africa on summer exchanges uh, through her music program. And she was going to both um, Ghana and to um, uh, Benin. Oh, yeah, she was going to okay. Benin, and it was the one of the times she went to Benin. She she went to a ceremony and she started seeing some things, mm. and she came back and and that started taking her over, and she started dreaming about what she saw. Okay, and. Um, she started uh, talking to me about it, you know, because uh, I wasn't trying to necessarily convert her or anything like that. Right. You know, we, we're not proselytizing. Exactly. You know, you know it's we like, don't. you know, we, 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 we do our thing. And if people ask us, then, you know, we'll, we'll talk to them about it. But, you know, I wasn't trying to convert her. She was right. doing her thing. I was doing mine. And um she started asking me about what the sh what did I think these these dreams meant in terms of um, the ceremonial people who were coming to her in her in her dreams, and I said, "Well, I think they they they're trying to tell you you need to you need to follow them and and learn some more about who they are." Mm -hmm. You know, point blank. That's 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 what I think is happening. You know, right and. Um, so she started, you know, she started um, wanting to find out more about the tradition. And um, she, when, when, when I had my, you know, public Ocha Bimbe, when I was getting initiated in 2003, she, she, uh, I had moved to California and she was still living in, in Ohio. 
And she came to that ceremony. She came oh. to the public ceremony and saw, saw me and saw the whole process. And she, she started, um, she started really seeking out a, uh, a priest, a Babalao, and um, she got involved with uh, an Ile in Baltimore. And uh, that was strictly Nigerian. They, they, they were not involved with any, any of the, uh, the Santeria, Lukumi, or okay. Rodu, you know, or the Akan, you know, as, as they have it in, um, on the East Coast. They were strictly Nigeria. And, 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 and all the, the priests who, who come through their house go to Nigeria to get initiated. Okay. And so she got, in, she got uh, involved with that and, and, uh, and, and eventually got initiated. And she is now a priestess of Oshun. Okay. Yeah. And um, we're not as close as we were then, but we, we still talk um, quite frequently by phone. And uh, um, and I feel like I was a part of her making that transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at UC Davis, I met uh, someone I consider my second daughter. And uh, she started asking me about the religion and wanting to know more about it. So I started actively teaching her and training her and doing some divination for her. Um, and so she's currently um, doing some things. She has her Eshu. She has uh, her, uh, her main Aleke. And she's come and gotten blessed by um, Ia Ohene Mini. Okay. So um, she's now off in Tennessee at, at a, a job that she got after get, getting her PhD at UC Davis, which I helped her do right right before I retired. I said, you better hurry up because I'm about to retire. And okay. That, and this is, you know, that's, this is, that, that's it. When I leave, you're going to have right. a hard way to go dealing with these white people. <laughs> oh, Lord. It was the truth. Mm. Mm. You know, you know how it is on these dissertation committees. Yeah. So, yeah. um, she, um, she got it. She she got it right. Right as I was leaving, she got her she got her degree, and um, she's now um, you know doing what she can and consulting with me. And she will be growing increment incrementally uh, on her way. So I have I have two young women who had uh, who became my daughters and who really claimed me and met my family and all of that, you know, and, and came to family uh, uh, dinners and occasions there. And um, so uh, I have those two. Um, one is um, her, her birth name is Erica, the first one, and um, her priest name is Oshundara. Mm. And uh, the second one is uh, Ayo, Walker, who is a uh, assistant professor of dance in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, right now. All right, that's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. I feel very fulfilled with them. You know, um, since I didn't have my own children, they have really kind of let me know that I do have the maternal instinct. <laughs> mm. I had to help them with more than just you know, their, their spiritual development. <laughs> yes. It, it, right. It, it, it's all encompassing. Yes. You know, it's like, we don't, there's no separation between our, you know, our physical needs and our social needs and our spiritual needs. And, exactly. you know, like it's your, your spiritual parents, right? Like they, they're providing everything, you know, that's why we, 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 we have to honor them, you know, and we're, we're indebted to them because they really give of themselves entirely. Um, so, uh, hey, you know, we're, we're kind of, um, you know, the last set of questions here, we've, you know, we've, we've covered a lot, right? But I wanna, I so we, we, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up a little bit, start to okay. wrap it up. 
But, and this question for you, I know is gonna be a big question. So you can feel free to summarize because when we do our artistic expression interview, I know you'll have more to say. But this question is how does your faith influence your creativity and artistic expression? What have you been inspired to do because of your faith? Well, just as you said, it's all it's all one. It's all integrated, you know. Mm -hmm. So how can you, you know, how can you divide yourself up? Okay, now I'm being an artist. Now I'm being mm -hmm. a priest, you know. Now I'm being a mother, you know. Uh, now I'm being a wife. Uh, it's it's all it's all connected. And um, I'll say this, and I'm going to say more about it in in the second interview. Uh, I have done well since I came into the tradition as a, you know, a, a practitioner uh, later than my career, my artistic career, immediately I started feeling like, well, I've got to, I've got to do some choreography that pays homage to Orisha. Okay. You know, that, I mean, immediately that came into my mind. And so I've done two pieces. One um, is, um, called Oshun, Goddess of Love. So you know who that is is uh, in tribute to. Mm -hmm. and I did that way back in Hawaii in the 90s. And in fact, uh, I first did it as a, uh, I, I choreographed a solo for myself using a lot of her movements and attributes of, the, of uh, Oshun. And then I decided I was gonna put that into a larger piece with some of my, student dancers that um, premiered in Honolulu back in 1996. And the finale of that piece, Oshun, mm. Goddess of Love, um, somebody snapped a picture of the finale as we were taking our bows. And that photograph is gonna be the cover of my new memoir. Oh. Right. But because I'm a child of Oya, and I first did a piece of for Oshun, I in order to make sure Oya was going to be cool, I said, "Now, Ia, you know I'm going to do a dance for you. You know this. I, I I'm I'm saving the best for last. So I've done one for Oshun, but I'm definitely got to do one for you. And you know it's going to be uh, a a masterpiece." So, yes. but I left it, I left it like that for several years. And when I came here to Sacramento in 2017, 2017, I said, my, uh, my, one of my friends at uh, the dance department at Sacramento State University, she says, I'd like you to do a piece for um, <clears throat> the 25th anniversary for my company called Sacramento Black Art of Dance. And immediately popped into my mind, you know you owe Oya a dance. Okay. And I said, there, I cannot do one other piece of choreography until I do, I do a tribute to her. Mm. And I ended up doing it and it's and, and it ended up being one of the, the most uh, memorable pieces of my choreographic career. It's called mm -hmm. In the Eye of the Storm. Oh, wow. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's been reprised uh, recently. And um, it's, um, I consider it one of my masterpieces, you know? Wow. Yeah. Are there excerpts of it or like online anywhere where we could see it? Yep. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Okay. Okay. And that might be a good uh, thing for you to look at in preparation for our, our next interview. Oh, yeah, that, that would be awesome. Right. Because, because, that, because that, yeah, can... that, that is really um, mm -hmm. the essence of the answer to that question. That piece shows you okay. how my, 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 my spiritual tradition informs my artistic work. Mm. Perfect. In the eye of the storm. Gosh, you know, is is I can't think of now. Like, I mean, is there a better phrase to to really express 
our existence, right, in this country and and in the, you know, in through colonialism, right? Like we've always black people, African descended people, have been in the eye of the storm um, this whole time, and we've been and we've survived, you know, and we've thrived. Um, so yeah. there's 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 that. And in this year, I mean, God, Mama Oya's energy has been so strong. I know. L- l- last year, when we did, we we do a, a, a divination for the year, and mm. she was, and she was right in the middle of our last year. It's like we're mm. at war, and and you, and you're going to need all the spiritual energy you can muster in order to win these battles. Yes, she's been working. <laughs> most definitely she, she, she's yeah. been working My mother. Um, so you know we I, I wonder are there let's see can I is there like a natural transition from that one well yeah you I love her too I I you know she affirmed me you know um affirmed me in in important ways when I um when I was first starting out so I have a really, you know, special relationship with her. She affirmed um, the parts of me that are modest, you know, my modest dress, um, my simple dress, my simple white, white skirt that I had is what I could afford at the time. You know, um, I didn't have anything fancy, you know, but I, I, I was covered up. And so, and that's something that was important to me. And so, you know, she affirmed that, you know, for me and, and the songs that I would sing, you know, to my ancestors that I learned. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I really, you know, I, I really appreciate her. I really appreciate her, the aspect of her, her femininity, right? I appreciate mm, that yes. kind of femininity. Yeah, because because yeah. people don't always associate her with being feminine, but she is, you know, she you know she's she's a fierce woman. She's a fierce woman and she, you know, she lets you know that she is all woman. You know, it's just that we have this this stereotypic uh, idea of what woman is. And she's right. saying, Mm-mm. you know, it's, it's like the rainbow. It's all the colors. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. all the colors. And, you know, I really feel um, uh, within the Vaudoux tradition that that she is very close to um, Erzali Dantor. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That fierce warrior woman. I could see that. Yeah. For sure. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh. We we love her. We love her. Um, this interview is so interesting because there's so much that we're just chatting about. And then we go back to the questions. But <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh you, you mean that hasn't happened before? <laughs> not in this way you know like not in this way it's, it's so interesting you know it's it's just you know every every connection is different you know and every what we have to talk about and what we're you know what I'm what I'm responding to that's why you know why I, I was just telling a group of students today I was doing a guest lecture and I said you know remember that you as a researcher you are you are an important research instrument right you're not neutral so oh, your positionality no. is going to greatly impact and influence your results. As qualitative researchers, we're cognizant of that. We're hyper aware of that in a way that, you know, quantitative research, you know, um, does does not, uh, is not always right. aware of and acknowledged. Right, right, right. right? And, and, so, and, 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 and it's a myth that the, uh, the researcher is some kind of objective viewer that has, you know, ha- has no stake in... <laughs> You know, right. and in, in, in the actual research, you know, that, that I don't know where how well I know it's that U- European positivism that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that that uh, that made us think that that's the, that was the reality when it was just the opposite. They were all they, they were all in, in involved with with uh, their so-called objective findings. Right, right. Mm-hmm. They, they found what they were looking for. Right. <laughs> exactly (laughs) exactly what they wanted to see yeah um and and, and they were usually told what people thought they wanted to hear (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes so we're you know this is this this is us we 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 are being us we're being ourselves and this is 
you know, this is how research can look. So I'm really proud of the, you know, these interviews because it's, you know, these oral history interviews. This, this is another a really important part, you know, of research that, you know, that a survey couldn't get, you know. Um, so you, you got to have that one-to-one -one connection and and talk to people and and listen to their lived experiences. Yeah. Um, and, and I wonder, so maybe that's like a good segue, right? Talking about your lived experiences. Are there any favorite memories about, you know, practicing your faith in the Bay Area? That, is there anything that stands out to you? Or, or any any places that are especially important to your worship? Well, you know, I guess I mentioned that um, Ochabembe, the public coming out of my mm. uh, uh, of my being crowned as Oya, you know, that was a very special uh, day, and you know, de definitely Oya came came down on me. And um, there were key people there that uh, are very important in the, in the tradition. Um, uh, a Babalao who wrote one of the um, uh, Ifa texts, who has translated a lot of the 256 Odu, um, uh, Baba uh, Opega. Ipega, sorry, he uh, he he was there. My uh, spiritual father, um, uh, bless his uh, his spirit. He uh, Baba Bolu Fatumashe from Nigeria was there. Um, Marcus Gordon, who is one of the first Bay Area um, uh, African Americans who became a part of the tradition, who is a cantor, He's, he knows all the, the Lukumi yeah. liturgy, the songs. He was the singer. Um, uh, Tobaji Stewart, who is one of the most proficient um, master drummers in uh, the Bata tradition. He was ahead of the drummers. We, uh, um, And Iya from Oyotunji Village, who was mm -hmm. what it was a priest of Oya. Uh, she came. Uh, there was just, you know, key people there that I'll never forget. So I know mm -hmm. that it was a special mm -hmm. uh, coming together of various traditions from Nigeria and the Cuban Lukumi tradition. Awesome. And that doesn't usually happen in that way. And, mm. I, and I see myself <clears throat> as a kind of crossroads because um, Louisa Tish is strongly Lukumi. Uh, Baba Bolu Futumashe was a Baba Lao from Nigeria who was very highly respected. And so it was the marriage of those two that really... Um, mm -hmm crowned me. And so I feel like I'm a bridge in that and that particular day of the of my coming out, public coming out, um, really represented that. And it's something I'll never forget. Oh, oh, that is lovely. That that is lovely. Wow. You you you've been so generous. Thank you so much, Ia. I want, is there anything else before we close? Is there anything that you'd like to share? No, I think I've shared a lot. You have? <laughs> I, I, uh, I, can't, I can't think of anything else. If, if, if there is, it'll come out in the second interview. The second interview. Okay, so we'll, we'll stay tuned. But this has just been really awesome, really, really rich. Um, I, you know, I, I say this before, but I, I'm gonna, I have to say it again now because it's always true. But I know that those who are watching the video on YouTube or they're listening to it on Spotify, I know that they're really going to be blessed by this. I know that they're going to resonate with so much of your story. And I, you know, I just pray that it that it really uplifts them and it affirms for them what needs to be affirmed you know, on their path, on their journeys. So, you know, this is just so powerful. Just listening to your, hearing your life story is really, really powerful. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a guide 
you know, it's a, this, this, it's a story, you know, that can really guide us, those of us who are listening um, on our own path and our own journey. So thank you so very much for joining us on Embodied Memories of the Bay. And well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored. To... <laughs> I'm honored, Iya I- Khadidra, that you, that you asked me to do this. And I think it's, it is very important because as I mentioned before, I think that a lot of, uh, of uh, this tradition on the West Coast mm-hmm. get, does not get the attention that it deserves. And we've been carrying this tradition here in California for a long time. Yes. Yes, Ashe. And this, now is the time, you know, hopefully to re- share those stories, talk yeah. to those elders and share, share those stories. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And um, we look forward to to speaking with you again soon. All right. <laughs>